Hello, and welcome to lecture five of this introduction to machine learning class. The topic of today's lecture is logistic regression, which means that we switch from talking about regression, that was the topic of the initial four lectures, to classification. And this will be our topic for the next four lectures. So what is the difference between regression and classification problems? In uh, regression, we're using some predictor variables uh, to predict a response variable, which is usually continuous. In classification, we want to classify um, our samples into discrete classes. So for example, if you're given an image and you want the algorithm to tell if it's a cat or a dog, that's a classification problem. There can be more than two classes. It can be cat, a dog, or a crocodile, or a panda. That's also a classification problem. So we can think of the response variable in classification of being a categorical variable, so a variable that takes values in the set of cat, dog, crocodile, panda. Um, it's important that these are discrete categories and that there is no order on them, right? So the crocodile is as far from a cat as from a panda. Um, we, we don't assume any, any ordering because you can have discrete, ca discrete values that are ordered, like integers, this is not what we are going to talk about now. So he, for us, in, the, on, in all these classification lectures, we assume that the categories are unordered and uh, the response variable y is, is categorical. And if there are only two classes, which is by far the most common situation, um, at least in textbooks, um, this is called a binary classification problem. So this would be cat versus dog. Uh, if there are more than two classes, this is called multi-class or multinomial classification problem. It is convenient, we will, mathematically convenient, to not, to, 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 to label each of the categories with an integer starting from zero. So talking about binary classification problem, we will be talking about response variable y taking values in zero or one set, right? So it can be zero or it can be one. Um, if there's more than two classes, then it will be from zero to k minus one, where k is the number of classes. And we will start and actually spend most of the lecture talking about binary classification problems. So I will not be talking about cats and dogs anymore. I will be just talking about zeros and ones from now on. So the first question that's really important and that we, that we need to clearly understand is why we need something else. Why can't we just keep using linear regression as we did we have all the machinery nicely set up. Now we have y's that can be zero and one, so maybe we can just do the same thing. And in, in fact, in some situations, it's, it's not too bad. But there are problems with that. So let me, let me try to explain the problems. Here's an example data set, very simple data set. There's one predictor x. Uh, so it's like simple linear regression that we had before. There's only one predictor x. There's, all, there's, there's a response y, all points are either on the zero line or on this one line, right, as we, as we agreed on, on on the previous slide. And here I assume that one can actually predict pretty well. So for all, uh, let, let, let's take a concrete example. So previously I was talking about predicting height from, from age, I think. So here we can talk about predicting, for example, whether a person went to school or not, or started going to school, depending on age. So X is age. And for a very young ages, the answer is no. That's why all the points here are at zero. And then from some age, it's mostly ones. Um, and of course, there's some gray zone where some people go to school earlier or don't go to school until, until later. Um, so imagine that that's the data and we run linear regression and we get the, the line of the best fit and it looks like that. And then we can, we can additionally say that, well, whenever the prediction is above 0 0.5, we say it's one, and whenever it's below 0 0.5, we say it's zero. So we categorize the, 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 the prediction to get actually predicted class. Is it, is it a good model or is it a bad model? In this case, actually, it will not be so bad. It's uh, conceptually, uh, or like theoretically, it's uh, unsatisfactory, I would say, because we're predicting values that are above one or below zero often, and this doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Um, but there's a, a particular practical problem with that too. So imagine I'm adding one more observation here, and that's here on the right. And this can be a person that was added to the data set that's really old, and of course went to school, so sits here at y equals one. 
For our linear regression model, this is a huge outlier. There will be enormous error, right? So our mean squared error here will grow by uh, a lot, and the, the, the line will change to adapt for that, and will go a lot lower over here to minimize this error, which means that we'll start making errors for all these points over here, and the model will start being much worse. And this all often happens in linear regression if you have a strong outlier. The problem here is that this is not really an outlier, right? It, 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 it perfectly fits to, to the model, uh, like pr the, this categorical classification model that we're trying to build here. So it's only outlier because we have this linear model, which is of course inappropriate for, uh, for this case. So that illustrates why it's not a good idea to use linear regression, even though in some cases it might work fine. So we want something else. We want, in fact, to construct our model such that we're predicting y hat, that's our predicted variance, remember, to be between zero and one, not outside. And why do I say between zero and one, even though y without hat, so the actual values, are either zero or one, right? So that's another important point. We want, at least in this lecture, we will want, to predict something that can vary from zero to one and take all the values in between because we will be interpreting this as a probability that the um, sample belongs to class one. If the probability is 100%, okay, that's one, coincides then with the sample one, but maybe the probability is 80% and then we'll be predicting 0.8, probability according to our model. So the, the deep, um, conceptual statement here, uh, philosophical perhaps, is that in many cases it is actually, it makes more sense to predict probabilities than just class membership. So think about it like in practice you want to, maybe it's a classification problem where you have a patient date and you want to predict if, if a person is sick or not. It's much better if your model tells you the person is sick with probability 99% or the person is sick with probability 52% rather than having a model that just tells you the person is sick or the person is not sick, right? You, you, you want this probabilistic statement and actually in most cases you want it. So um, I'm arguing that it's good and that's what we'll try to do here, that's what linear regression, try, that's what logistic regression tries to do, is to predict the probability. That's why the predicted values will be, will, can vary from zero to one, take all the values in between. Okay, um, that's actually, I think, why logistic regression is called regression, even though it's a classification problem, because we actually will be dealing with continuous predictions and not with discrete predictions, funny enough. Okay, so how do we achieve that? We want we want, so here's our x variable, let's say, and we want some function that maybe is, goes to zero here and goes to one here and, and kind of has this, this shape. This will fit to our, for example, example with age and, and going to school or not. So it turns out that there are many such functions, so you, one can choose different things. A very convenient and common choice is a so-called logistic function. Uh, that has the sigmoid form, so it's also called sigmoid function often, that has the sa this, this equation. So you can, you can easily see that when x goes to minus infinity, this goes to zero because this becomes a large number, and when x goes to plus infinity, this becomes a very small number, so you have one over one, so it goes to one. And at zero, it's right in the middle at point uh, five. Okay, so this is a logistic function without any parameters. That's just like the raw, the logistic function as it is. We of course want to fit logistic function to our data set. So for example, if we have this, this, this imaginary data set with age versus school attendance, we want to adjust some parameters to fit this logistic function. So how would you adjust these parameters? Well, maybe you want to shift the entire logistic function left to right, or maybe you want to squeeze it or, or, or stretch it, right? That's two parameters that one can think of. So in fact, if I write logistic out of this linear, um, linear function of x, that, that this will do exactly that. I can rewrite it a bit differently, uh, plug it into the formula, and then you will see that if I write it like that, 
then the the center, the middle of midpoint, is at when whenever x is equal to a, right? That's when this is zero, so you get one half as the as the predicted value, and then the second parameter, this beta, um, the beta one, it actually governs the slope here. So the larger the beta, the steeper this curve, and the smaller the beta, the more shallow the slope is here. And one can take the derivative and, and verify very easily that the slope is actually just proportional to beta one. Uh, it's beta one over four. Um, so this is the analog of simple linear regression for, for this logistic regression would be fitting beta one and A or beta one and beta zero equivalently um, so that this, this, this sigmoid stretched and shifted in some sense fits these points the best, right? Um, if there's more than one predictor, then it's exactly the same thing as we had in linear regression. We just replace this this linear function of x with the linear function of, of the vector x, uh, where we assume that vector x has the intercept column. Uh, the, so the first value of the vector x is one, as we had in, in, in linear regression. So that's exactly the same here. And we'll be just talking about the beta vector here. So that's, uh, so observe that after you multiply beta by with x, you just have a scalar, it's just one number, and then you can put it through the logistic function to get a probability. Okay, great. So um, one thing that I'd like to discuss here is that linear regression is called a linear classifier. Why is it linear? So we, we're, the, the logistic function is obviously a non-linear function. However, we will, it's, it's, uh, people say that this is a linear classifier because the probability is some transformation of a linear function of x. You take x, you multiply it by beta, that's a linear function. Okay, and then you apply nonlinear transformation to get a probability out of it, to squeeze it to the 0 0.1 range. Um, but before you did that, that's a linear function of x. And another way to see why, why it makes sense to call it linear then is to look at decision boundary that you're getting out of that with when, when you have several predictors. So let me explain this little cartoon. So here you have two predictors, x1 and x2. This is this kind of image I will be using a lot during this lecture. So circles denote one class and crosses denote another class. And let's say you fit the, the model to this logistic regression model to this data, then for each point on this plane, you get a predicted probability, right? So you can think of that as a, the plane is, is horizontally, and then you fit this, um, um, you, 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 you fit a, a surface, which is a plane, that's like a prediction plane that, uh, that is linear, and then you transform it through the sigmoid and get the predicted probability. So where are the, all the points that have the predicted probability one half? And I argue that that's a straight line here because this corresponds to the points that have that, that where beta times x is zero and beta times x is zero, that's an equation for a line. So, and, and we can call it a decision boundary because if we say that everything that has probability b above 50% to belong to class one, we'll just call class one, for example, and, and, and below it's class zero, then this is our decision boundary, right? And this boundary is linear in logistic regression, and whenever the decision boundary is linear, we call it um, like always linear, uh, we call this algorithm a linear classifier. So not all problems, obviously, can be solved by a linear classifier or by logistic regression. So here's an example of a, of, of a problem that clearly is where the two classes are clearly separated. It should be easy to, in fact, distinguish class one from class zero, right? But there's no dis linear decision boundary that can do that. You, you need a circle as a decision boundary. Um, but in fact, it's the same thing as we discussed before with regression, where remember that we, we talked about polynomial regression, which is still linear regression, with just added polynomial features, and then you can, you can actually fit nonlinear functions with it. So with the same trick works here. You can add polynomial features to your problem, and this will, at least in some cases, 
allow you to, to convert this kind of problem to a problem that can be solved by a linear classifier. So in this case, the correct, the correct decision boundary is a circle, equation of a circle is quadratic, so uh, let's, try, let's, let's add quadratic features, and in fact it's enough to just add x1 squared. So you have three features now, x1, x2, and x1 uh, squared, and all the crosses have larger value of x1 squared compared to all the, all the circles, right? So you have to imagine that along this third dimension, all the circles are in the bottom, and the crosses are over here in a larger circle. So it's very easy to linearly separate them. It's just a plane that goes in between them. So the separation, the decision boundary is just a plane here. And if you, if you collapse it and, and draw the same thing here, then actually the decision boundary will be a circle. Um, so that's, that's exactly analogous to polynomial regression. For the regression case, one can do the same thing with logistic regression and obtain some nonlinear classification boundaries. Um, but let's get back to, to, to just setting up the logistic regression because we actually are not finished. We discussed how we can predict, like what's the formula to obtain y hat values from the x given some parameters beta, but what we did not describe, the missing ingredient is the loss function. So how do we judge if a given sigmoid, given the parameters, fits the data that we have well or, or it doesn't. And for this, we need a loss function. And um, again, the question is here, conceptual question is why can't we just keep using the same loss function that we had for linear regression? We can use this formula for y hats now, okay, uh, and then still use the mean squared error loss function. So whenever this is zero, it, the, the y hat should be close to zero, that's what we want. Whenever this is one, the y hat should be close to one. This is again what we want. It seems, it seems rather meaningful. So from, from the way I'm asking, you probably guess that it's a bad idea, but it's not entirely stupid idea. One can do it like that. The reason why it's, again, arguably not so good is because imagine that you're predicting class one with 99% probability, and another model predicts class one on the same sample with 99.99% probability. From the point of view of mean squared error, that's around the same uh, mean squared error, right, around one. However, probabilistically, these are very different things. It's one thing to be wrong. Let's say the, the truth is that the, this sample actually belongs to class zero. So in this case, you predicted one, you something happened that you predicted would happen with 1% probability, and in this case, a different model, something happened that you predicted would happen with probability 0.01%. That's 100 times more unlikely. You should definitely want to penalize this model much more for this specific case, right? And this is something that mean squared error will not do. So we want, um, we want a, a, a better loss function that is somehow takes into account this, the nature um, of our probabilistic prediction problem. So we can either just think of one, uh, but let's try to derive it in some sense. So recall previously we discussed um, that the mean squared error loss function actually follows from a um, assumption of Gaussian noise if we use the maximum likelihood principle. So we assume the probabilistic model that has the Gaussian noise. We say we want the most likely solution of that. That's the maximum likelihood principle. And mm, mean squared error loss function just, just pops out of the, um, of the formulas. Can we do the same trick here? Yes, we can. So let's, let's try to do that. Um, of course, we don't have Gaussian noise here. We actually don't have any additive noise. We're predicting something. Uh, that's our y hat. Let's say with 80% probability it should be class 1. But it can be either class 1 or class 0. So this is described mathematically as a Bernoulli random variable. So it's, a random, it's just basically a coin flip. It's something that can be one or zero. And the probability of one is p and probability of zero is just one minus p. So it's a biased coin. That's Bernoulli random variable is nothing else than a biased coin. Um, in our case, so let's try to convert this now into the likelihood of our entire training set right, that has, so I now goes over overall samples in our training set from one to N. And whenever we're predicting 
So h of x i is our prediction of the model, what the probability is. And then if the sample is actually one, then this is, the, this is part of the likelihood, the, um, because that's the prob that was our predicted probability to observe one. And whenever sample is zero, then one minus our prediction is, as written here, then the part of the likelihood. And the entire likelihood is just the product because it's a probability to see the sample number one under our model times the probability to see sample number two times the probability to see sample number three. So it's just a huge product. It's just a bit inconvenient to write it here because I'm writing it. So this is a product over all samples that have value one. And this is a product over all samples that have value zero in the training data. Um, okay, so that's the likelihood. Fine, nothing, nothing much happened here. We discussed before that it's convenient to, to work with log likelihood because you get rid of the probabilities and you, you, you get sums, which is, which is often very convenient. And also it's convenient to flip the sign. So we just do the same thing here. We compute the negative log likelihood and you get this equation. Um, that is clear. One little trick is that it's convenient to rewrite this now as one sum. So it's a bit, um, it's a bit cumbersome to write these two sums always. So I would like to have one sum that goes over the entire, the entire training set. How can I achieve that? So here's a trick. I say, I write it like that and then just observe what happens whenever yi is one, then this is one and I have this logarithm. So that's the same as here. And this is zero, so this entire thing falls out. Okay, great. And whenever i is such that yi is zero, then this falls out, and this is one, and I'm just left with this logarithm, which is the same as here, so it fits. It's the same, it's the same. I can rewrite these two sums as one sum using this yi variable. So see, this only works because they take, play, they, they take values zero and one, so that's, uh, one place where this is actually convenient notation. Okay, so this is the loss, right? We, we, will, we will use that as a loss, and you see that this logarithm, logarithms appeared here. Um, so let me just rewrite it here on the new slide. This is the loss function. Whenever I say h of xi, I mean this. So you can also just plug this in, in, in here in these two places, and, and this then is the full specification of the problem. If you if you give me a data set and you give me a beta vector, I can compute the loss and give you a number. If you give me another beta vector, the, the loss function will give you another number. So what you have here, given your training data, you have your space of possible parameters beta, and for each beta, you get a value, so you have this loss surface that you want to minimize. This is not a linear regression problem. In fact, it's, it's not a linear model because as we discussed before, a linear model is linear in the parameters. And here the parameters beta, this is obviously a non-linear transformation of the parameters. This is called a generalized linear model or GLM. Um, and this is part of a, of a big family of different GLMs. We will not be discussing a general theory of GLMs here. I'm just mentioning that um, because maybe you, you come across this term later on. So in some sense, it's still pretty linear, right? Because this beta, beta x factor, as I, as I tried to explain before, and there is just this non-linearity in the end, which makes this pretty simple to still work with. That's why it's called generalized linear model. So remember that generalized linear model does not mean linear model. Okay, um, good news. This function is convex. Just believe me here, one can show that's not difficult, that this is a convex function, meaning it just has one minimum. You can start anywhere you want, do gradient descent, converge to this minimum, great. Bad news is that there's no way to write down the solution. So the position of the minimum, the beta hat um, vector um, as a formula. There's no closed form solution like we had for linear regression. This is not possible here. So what we have to do if we actually face this problem is that we have to do some optimization and start with some guess and then go down the loss and converge to the, to the minimum. And that's how we obtain beta hat. In practice, usually the sec so-called second order methods are used to optimize logistic regression. And I didn't mention second order methods before. What this means is that I, the method doesn't only use the, the um, derivative 
of the laws with respect to beta to, to know where to go down, as gradient descent does, but it also computes the second derivative of the loss with respect to beta and, and, and uses that to choose the, the step size, essentially. Um, I just wanted to mention it briefly because um, this didn't come up previously, the second order methods, but here for simplicity, we'll be just using gradient descent to, to, to solve it, right? So it's, it's still possible. So let's try to derive the gradient descent for logistic regression. I will not do the full thing, but almost, so I will leave it as an exercise for you to compute the derivative of the sigmoid function. It's very simple, and you can verify that you get this. And then using that, we can start to compute the, um, the gradients. So we have this term in the, in the loss function, the logarithm of h of x, and we're computing the gradient of that. And um, so h of x is a g out of this, from, from this linear combination beta x, and again, it's pretty simple to see that when you start computing it, it's like the chain rule um, you know, in, in, in standard calculus. So you have log of something, so it's one over something times the uh, gradient of something, and then the gradient of something is given by this formula over here. That's why the first term will cancel with one over it, and you have this second bracket over here, and then you still have the gradient of what's inside g, but that's just beta times x and the gradient of that with respect to beta is just x. So you have x here and in the end, you can uh, take a piece of paper and try to derive it with more steps if you want, but that will be the end result. And similarly, if you, th this, this other term in the loss function, the gradient of that is given by this. And now if we put this all together, here was our loss function, we want a gradient of that Right, so we put the gradient inside the sum and then apply these formulas. Some things will cancel very nicely, so you will see that yi times, times this term over here will cancel with yi times this term over here, so that's, um, that's great. Just, just open the brackets and you will see that, that some things cancel and that's what you are left with. So that's very simple, actually. Here you have yi, here you have yi hat, essentially, right? That's how prediction, yi hat times the x, and then sum over the entire i. And we can write it in, in, in matrix form too, uh, where now the capital X is the whole design matrix, so a matrix that, that, that has all our samples as rows. We talked about that before. And y is a column vector of responses, and y hat is a column vector of our predictions over here. So we get this gradient, which is, as you see, a super simple formula. One can program it very easily if one wants to program the gradient descent. Um, it's just one line of code, essentially. Now, amazingly, if you remember how it looked for linear regression, you might have noticed that this is the same formula. So the formula I have here in red is identical up to a constant factor, like 1 over n, which doesn't matter, is identical to the formula we had for linear regression even though the y hat has a different meaning because the y hat is now given by this very different formula. It's not just beta x, but h of beta x. Um, but it works out that the formula in the end using y hat is the same. And this actually follows from the general GLM theory, so it's the same for any GLM, which is hints at, 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 at how great the GLM framework is, but let, here I'm just pointing out it as, as, a, as an interesting fact. Now, so we're done. Now we have the loss function for logistic regression. We know how to do gradient. Um, we can obtain solution. That's it. Let's now discuss the properties of that. Can we overfit by doing that? Yes. So in fact, everything that we discussed in previous lectures about overfitting, regularization, bias variance trade-off, all these things, all of that applies to logistic regression as it did apply previously. So let me show you. Here's an example. That's the training data. It has some x's and some zeros. Um, look closely and you will see that in my, if I'm fitting a straight line here, then of course I'm misclassifying. I'm doing pretty good, but I'm misclassifying a few points here. Um, and that's not the best one can do probably here. This has high bias because uh, I will always consistently misclassify the axis over here. 
if, if I sample from this data set over and over again. Now let's, let's do exactly the same thing we did in one of the previous lectures where we adding, imagine that we're adding polynomial predictors to the model, but I will not be drawing polynomial predictors. I will still show x1, x2 plane and just draw now the curved decision boundary. It's curved because I have high order polynomial predictors. Okay, so maybe I added quadratic or the third power and I get uh, a function, uh, so the decision boundary that is like that and maybe that's actually how the data are generated, right? So these axes uh, still belong to class one. There's one misclassified zero. Well, that's noise in the data, it can happen. But if I keep increasing the dimensionality of my predictor space, then at some point, my model will be so flexible that the decision boundary will become so curved that it will just go around, you know, go around like that. Every single, um, every single example in the training set, and you will get 100% classification accuracy on the training data. Of course, if you then get test data and use the same curved decision boundary, then most likely you will be often very wrong, because this has high value, this is a high variance situation, right? For every new training set, so just remind about what high variance means. If you generate different data sets or if you imagine generating different data sets from the same distribution, you will get very different decision boundaries every time uh, because it just depends on the noise, it fits the noise. That's why it's called high variance. So this is a bias variance trade-off, right? The training error decreases if you increase the model complexity and the test error decreases, then increases again. There is some sweet spot. You can use cross-validation to find the sweet spot. If you use um, a penalty, a regularization term like reach penalty or lasso penalty, one can use either of them with logistic regression. And then the model complexity just goes from like low complexity means low penalty. Uh, no, uh, yes, low complexity. Low complexity means high penalty and high complexity means low penalty, right? That's the high variance part. Okay. One thing that deserves a special mention here is if you increase the predictor space enough, then you get into the regime, like remember in the linear regression, we get to the regime that I called interpolation regime. So whenever you have more predictors than the samples in linear regression, your training error is zero. That's one aspect of that. You can have multiple beta hat vectors that give you the training error, the training loss of zero. That's another aspect of that. And then additionally, we discussed that under some conditions, it can actually be that if you select a particular one out of this multiple, the minimum norm beta hat, then actually it may, it may perform well in practice. Here for logistic regression, we have a conceptually similar thing, but uh, it manifests a bit, uh, itself a bit differently, and that's called perfect separation. So, um, in fact, it can occur if you just have two predictors um, without strong correlation between predictors. So this is different from regression. In, in regression, this cannot happen. So let's say we only have two predictors. Nothing is very strongly correlated. It's a nice data set. Here are all the zeros. Here's all the ones we can, it seems there's no problem, right? We can perfectly classify them with 100% accuracy on the training data and maybe even on the test data because this is such a simple problem. However, for logistic regression, there is a problem in a sense because if you think what will happen with your beta hat, your loss, the training, training loss will converge to zero as you run your gradient descent, but your beta hat will diverge to infinity. And why does it happen? It happens because the, the, let's say this is your decision boundary right here, but then the model wants the prediction here to be as close to zero as possible and the predictions here to be as close to one as possible. So you, you, you should imagine here the, 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 that you're putting these values through the sigmoid, right? And then you get something that looks like that or let me show it like that maybe. So you're predicting zero, zero, zeros, then it goes up and you start predicting ones and the loss will be smaller if this, if this is super steep, if it's basically a step like that. And this corresponds to beta hat actually diverging to infinity. So that's not 
very nice. And this is a problem that one, one happens if you have the perfect separation in training data. One way to, to, to deal with that is to use some regularization. If you put some regularization, it's like putting the prior on the beta coefficients. We talked about that before. So it will not diverge to infinity anymore. They will, they will stand somewhere. And the interesting, a very interesting topic is that I only very briefly mentioned here is that actually it is possible that the sum, in some sense, sorry, in some sense, there will still be different beta hats. They diverge to infinity, but there can be different decision boundaries too, right, here. So the magnitude diverges to infinity, but the direction of the beta vector can also be slightly different. And some of these directions may actually perform uh, pretty well in some cases. Um, we may talk about this um, in, in, um, in other lectures. But what, so if you have, if you're in a situation where you have a lot more predictors than, than your samples, happens for example when you train neural networks, uh, which is not a logistic regression, but very, very flexible model that can fit any training data, for example, then you can reach the situation where the training loss is actually zero, and at the same time neural network can perform well on a, on a test set. And that's because it's not just any beta hat that you get out of the of training procedure, but some particular beta hat, and that's another example of implicit regularization. Um, okay, so let me, in the interest of time, to proceed to, to, to several more comments here. Logistic regression is designed to give you probabilistic predictions, right, as I tried to explain. So it does not give you a class, label, zero or one, it gives you a probability. If in some cases you want to obtain, um, actually, you want to have a class assignment, you want to say, um, you want to somehow get from the probabilistic prediction to just binary uh, class label, you can do that, but you need a cutoff or a threshold. So you, you, you get a probability out of the model, 75% it's class one. And then you say, well, if it's 75, if it's above 50, I say it's class one. So that's your decision rule. Um, you just threshold the probabilities at some level and it's common to uh, threshold at 50%, but you don't have to threshold at 50%. That's something that it's a choice, it's a decision that you have to, to make about whether you draw, where you draw the, the boundary, you know, the threshold between, between class zero and class one. And there are many considerations that can enter into this choice. So it's common to choose a cutoff that maximizes accuracy, and by accuracy I just mean the fraction of samples that you classify correctly. Um, even then, if you want to maximize the accuracy, it doesn't necessarily mean that the 50%, the, the cutoff of 0 0.5 will be the best. You might additionally want to select the cutoff. So you first you fit the logistic regression model, you're just looking at the loss, which is not the accuracy, and you choose some, the procedure gives you some, some beta um, as the solution, the beta hat. And then you can additionally choose the cutoff uh, based on, for example, maximizing the accuracy. Like in a separate cross-validation loop, for example. It may often be close to 0 0.5, though, if you're, if you're um, maximizing the accuracy. However, not always you will want to maximize the accuracy. In some cases, you might prefer to make errors in one direction than in another. Let's say you're predicting whether a person is sick, the same example I used before, and you really don't want to miss potential, potentially um, positively uh, diagnosed, potentially infected, potentially sick people, you know? So you rather, you rather get a false positive that you maybe then later check than miss a true uh, class one case. So in this case, you might lower your threshold because you will have additional screening after, after, after that. Or you may be in a different situation where you actually don't want false positives. You, you don't want to have many false positives. You want only to detect something that is like really definitely class one. And then you increase the threshold so that you only get as class one something that where the model is 95% certain is class one and everything else is put as class zero, right? So you can imagine different real life situations where you have some considerations that tell you whether 
predicting one or predicting zero is more important. There are some trade-offs, maybe costs, like actually financial costs that, that will follow from this decision. All that then enters the decision about whether to, to do a cutoff. So people often just use just just think about accuracy, but not always accuracy is a meaningful um, measure in real life. And one way to, to think about this problem of choosing the threshold that you often see in, in practice is via this curve that is called ROC curve or receiver operator characteristic, weird name. Um, but what, what this curve shows is what happens when you change the threshold essentially from zero to one. And the axis on this plot uh, here is the false positive rate. So false positive rate is out of all my predictions, out of all cases when I predict one, how many of them are wrong? How many are actually zero? So that's called a false positive. What is my false positive rate? It can go from zero to one. And on the y-axis is the true positive rate, which is what fraction of the true ones do I discover or flag as ones? That's called a true positive rate. There are other terms for these things you might have heard, like sensitivity and specificity. These are confusing terms that people always mix up. That's why I prefer to use this, thing, this here. So, and now think how these things change. If you have some model and it's pretty good, it can separate two classes well, and then you change the threshold from zero to one. So if your threshold is zero, everything goes into, um, yeah, if your threshold is zero, then everything goes into class one. So your false positive rate is, uh, is one and your true positive rate is also one. So you're ex actually sitting right here at this point. That's obviously uh, not useful. If your threshold is one, another extreme, then you just misclassify everything as class zero and you, you, you end up here with true positive rate, false positive rate, everything is at zero. And now if you, if you change the threshold between zero and one, you have this sum curve, right? where, yeah, there's just some curve, depends on how the classes look like and, and how well your classifier does. So the better the classifier, the further this curve is from this diagonal line. Diagonal line is basically when you're predicting random outcome and you change the threshold, you will move along the diagonal line. If your classifier is not random, then it goes more towards this point. In, for any given real world, situation, you may have a curve like that. And then the question is, okay, which thresh threshold do you pick? And this curve doesn't tell you which threshold to pick because you have to have all these considerations about what false positive rate is tolerable for you or what true positive rate you want to achieve, right? And then you're just looking here and making some choice about which threshold is the best. Or you can, you can it doesn't have to be subjective choice. You can um, objectively, write down some, some function and say that's my criterion for choosing the, the threshold. I'm just saying that it's often something additional to the um, logistic regression model. Okay, one note here on the accuracy related to the previous slide is that accuracy can be actually a misleading number in many cases. For ex one example is if the classes are very unbalanced. So this is called a class imbalance. Imagine that you have um, I don't know, only like among all people, 95% don't have a particular disease and 5% do have a particular disease and that's what you're trying to classify. And then if you classify everybody as being healthy, you are at 95% accuracy. That's a meaningless number. That's, you, you're not predicting anything and you're already at 95%. And then whether it's 95 or 96, maybe that's actually a big difference, but uh, it doesn't sound as a big difference if you just look at the accuracy numbers. So if you have this very unbalanced classes situation, then accuracy is a particularly meaningless measure. There are some other measures that, um, like for example, false positive, true positive, some combinations of those, um, some other measures that can be more sensible uh, to describe how well your classi classifier performs. What is though important to say on the other hand is that logistic regression itself works just fine if you have class imbalance. So there's sometimes people um, get afraid. We have a class imbalance in our training set. What should we do? Um, there's actually nothing. You, in most cases, you don't need to do anything. It's fine. The logistic regression can work with that just fine, at least whenever in your training data and in your test data that's the same class imbalance, which is like we always assume that the test set uh, 
is from the same distribution as the training set, right? If it's not the case, then you have to do something. But um, if it is the case, it's fine. The logistic regression will, um, everything will work out okay. It's just that you might need to put additional thought in whether you're using accuracy or some particular other measure to choose a threshold um, whenever you have a strong class imbalance. All right, and this brings me almost to the end of this lecture. So this was the binary logistic regression. So what do we do if we have, um, if we have more, than, more than two classes? And it turns out that one can basically use almost the same machinery uh, to generalize it, and that's called, sometimes called multinomial logistic regression. So one way to formulate multinomial log logistic regression is via a so-called softmax function, something that you might have heard of if you, if you, if you um, did some neural network um, study or implementations. So that's common there. So let's now imagine a more general situation where you have k classes, maybe 10 different classes. So for each class from, from, from 0 to 9, I will actually use its own beta, okay? Its own beta vector. So now I have, in this situation, 10 different beta vectors. And then I'm using, so for each of them, I can compute the beta x, and that's my linear predict prediction that I want then to transform, in some sense, into probabilities. And I'm using the softmax function to do this, and the softmax function just makes, takes exponent of all my beta x and then divides by the sum of all exponents. So this makes sense because then the sum across all classes, it will, be, it will sum to one, which is what we want from probabilities. Um, and everything is positive, of course, because I took the exponent. So that's also something that we want from probabilities. So at least this makes sense here. Um, so if you can think about softmax as just a way to transform um, like any real number prediction for each of my 10 classes into something um, that can be interpreted as a probability. It's everything is positive and sums to one. That's one way of doing that. Um, note here an interesting thing is that actually this is sort of over, over specified um, formula because if I add any vector, fixed vector, to all betas, nothing will change. So imagine that I'm adding uh, some psi vector to every beta, then here I will have plus psi, so I can factor it out as a separate exponent with a psi in the exponent. And the same will happen in the denominator in the sum, so I can take it out of the sum and cancel. So the probability that I'm predicting will not be affected by any constant shift of all betas. So we can as well say, well, we'll just, fix, we'll just introduce one constraint and we'll somehow fix this psi for convenience. And one way, for example, is we can say, let's demand that one of the betas is zero, right? It, you, it, this doesn't change any predictions then because that's equivalent to just choosing the psi that is minus one of the betas. Then you just set one of the betas to zero. And then, of course, you don't have any freedom anymore. And everything else has to be, um, yeah, what it is is to stay what it is. So, so another way to say that is we can use the softmax function with an additional linear um, constraint. And for example, we can constrain one of the betas, last beta in this case, to be zero. And an interesting thing is that you can easily convince yourself that for a binary classification problem, this becomes equivalent to logistic regression then with this constraint. So imagine what, let's just see what happens if you have beta one um, as zero, then for, for the prediction of uh, that y equals one, you have here on the top, you just have one, right? Because it's zero, so the whole numerator is one and the whole denominator is one plus uh, exponent of beta zero x. So that's basically what we had in the logistic regression formula, it's up to the minus sign, which doesn't matter. We can flip the sign here. Um, so, yeah, so with this constraint, we can clearly see that it becomes equivalent to the logistic regression. If you don't, don't impose the constraint, it's still equivalent to logistic regression because, uh, because of this uh, freedom that I explained before. Yeah. 
Right, so, so as a summary of that, the logistic regression is a special case of the multinomial logistic regression defined by the softmax function. And whenever later on we're going to use neural networks, for example, to, to predict um, an object on an image, and there can be 10 different, different objects, we'll just be using the softmax function in the end uh, to get the probabilistic predictions out of the network. And if you have only two classes, uh, then it's related to the logistic regression problem because you just have a logistic function in the end. All right, so this is all for today. Thank you. <laughs>